National Socialist. I'd like to welcome everyone, uh, both those of you who are online and in person to Marxism 2022, changing the world in an age of capitalist crisis. First of all, I want to say how grateful we are after three years to be able to hold Marxism at least partially in person, although there will be many joining us online from various locations. As we begin the conference, it's important, I think, as settlers, that we acknowledge our occupation of lands that are the indigenous territories of Turtle Island. Furthermore, we support all struggles for indigenous sovereignty in whatever forms they take by the hundreds of First Nations and Inuit communities that have resided here for many thousands of years and by Métis communities that have developed in the last hundreds of years. And in terms of the theme of today's conference, changing the world in an age of capitalist crisis, it's important to acknowledge what a crucial role the struggles of Indigenous people have played and continue to play in the efforts to create a better world, whether that be the fight of the Wet'suwet'en land defenders in BC, the decades long struggle of the people of Grassy Narrows to stop the poisoning of their land and water, and the many other struggles against colonialism that go on on a daily basis in so-called Canada. The impact of war, climate chaos, inequality, oppression, and colonialism are felt by masses of people while the small ruling class get richer each day. This is how capitalism works. But people are resisting. Workers are organizing and striking. Indigenous land defenders are putting their lives and land on the line to stop the destruction. Thousands are marching to protest the environmental carnage that is destroying the natural world and threatens all life on the planet. We need to get rid of the capitalist system altogether. How do we achieve this? What are the strategies and tactics that can win a world of peace and equality? That's what the discussions today at Marxism will, will be about. So without further ado, let's get started. Our first session will be confronting the multiple crises of capitalism. We're glad to have three speakers here to address this question. One of the blessings slash curses of the pandemic has been turning necessity into a chance to share experiences globally over platforms like Zoom. And we have people here mostly virtually from various places, from Ghana, from Alberta, from New Brunswick, from BC, Thunder Bay, New York City, from Florida, from Arizona, and uh, one of our first speakers from the United Kingdom. So we're trying a hybrid conference this year. So there may be some technical glitches. So I'll ask for people's patience and indulgence at the beginning. So I'm gonna introduce the three speakers for this first session in the order they'll be speaking, and then I'll turn it over to them. Our first speaker, Joseph Chunara, is the editor of International Socialism Journal, and he's a leading member of our sister organization in the United Kingdom, the Socialist Workers' Party. He's the author of A Reader's Guide to Marxist Capital and Unraveling Capitalism, a guide to Marxist political economy. Our second speaker, Erfan Reze, is a physics instructor at UBC and Langara College on the unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people in Vancouver. He and his family arrived there in 1988 as convention refugees from Iran. He is an active member of the Vancouver IS branch and also volunteers in organizations that support refugees and migrant workers. Our last speaker will be Michelle Robidoux, who is a Toronto-based activist, co-author of Fighting Back on Turtle Island, Indigenous Sovereignty, 
the working class and anti-capitalism and a member of the International Socialists. So uh, the speakers will be speaking for about 45 minutes all together, and then we'll have some time for discussion. So I'm gonna hand it over to Joseph. Uh, go ahead, Joseph. Thank you, thank you, Baleen, and uh, greetings and solidarity to all, to all you people over there listening in. It's lovely to be with you today, even though I'm not with you in, in person. And, and it's a good day here in the UK because I've just got back from a protest in London where tens of thousands of trade unionists march through the street uh, in protest at the impact of the cost of living crisis. And that's important because we're going to need a lot more resistance and we're going to need a lot more of the kind of ideas that are going to be discussed by you in the, in the coming sessions because what we're facing now is a coming together of multiple different dimensions of crisis um, and dimensions of capitalist crisis. And that's going to be the theme linking together what I'm going to say uh, today. And I think this is important because um, the way these different elements of crisis are coming together pose a serious threat to all of us and begin to raise very, very powerful questions about the ability of capitalism to even reproduce itself as a system. It's that serious uh, today. So I'm gonna look at those different dimensions of crisis and show how they're all coming together in the current moment, particularly in the cost of living crisis uh, that we're facing. But the first and most basic uh, dimension of this crisis is the one that the chair has already alluded to, and in some ways the most fundamental which is the, the deep-seated ecological crisis that we're facing. And when we talk about ecological crisis, I remember when I was a sort of young socialist starting to get involved, it seemed like a distant cataclysmic event that might happen at some point in the future. It's not like that at all now. Uh, this is the lived experience of, of billions of people on the planet. And you only have to look around at what's happening today. Over here in, in Europe, um, unprecedented heat wave taking place in France, uh, temperatures over 40 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, extraordinary summer, uh, early summer temperatures, in Spain raging wildfires today threatening the lives of many people in the Spanish state. Uh, over uh, to the east in the on the borders between Bangladesh and India where my family ultimately comes from, uh, catastrophic flooding, uh, again imperiling the lives of people in that corner of the world. And we, we heard today, and we've heard it before, that something like one in six uh, of the population of Bangladesh will have to be relocated in the next decade to survive flooding events of this kind, driven by global warming. And we can add to that the swarms of locusts that have been spreading across Africa in these clim climate conditions, the fact that, that millions of people are pushed to the ed edge of starvation in the Horn of Africa in particular, and so on and so forth. There's this raging ecological crisis. And it's very important to say that this is reflected as well in the pandemic that we've lived through. Uh, if we want to understand viral pandemics like the coronavirus that we've experienced, we have to see them as viruses that emerge out of animal populations into human populations through processes that are encouraged, accelerated by capitalism. If you think about what capitalism does to the environment, capitalism ceaselessly expands into nature. It reorganizes ecosystems, it commodifies wildlife, including through large scale capitalist agri ag agribusiness. And these kind of processes, um, deforestation, uh, the formation of factory farms and so on and so forth, they make these zoonotic transfers from animal to human populations of viruses far more likely. In other words, the, the COVID-19 pandemic will not, be the net, will not be the last major pandemic of this kind that we see because of these destructive processes. And these processes of ecological degradation are linked to an inherent in capitalism, a point that, that Karl Marx and others made very, very, a very, very long time ago. The logic of capitalism is to degrade both nature and human labor. Uh, labor is no longer seen un under capitalism. Uh, 
as a process through which humans collectively satisfy their needs through some sort of collective interaction with nature, it's seen primarily as a form of profit making in order to feed capital's own expansion. So it both degrades the worker in this process, but also increasingly degrades the natural environment, even to the point of beginning to undermine the stability of capitalism itself. And it's not just a logic of rampant profit making. The other element of the logic of capital, which I'm gonna speak about in, 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 in this session, is a logic of competitive accumulation, a logic that systematically pitches rival capitalists and rival capitalist states against one another. Uh, so much so that any capitalist or state seeking to break with the logic of capitalism very rapidly faces an existential crisis. If you don't grab the maximum poss possible profit, if you don't then drive that profit back into accumulating more capital, you're very rapidly driven to the wall. So this logic of competitive accumulation uh, makes it incredibly difficult for capital to break with this path of ecological, uh, ecological destruction. At best, capitalism tends to pose technological fixes that really come as too little too late to address the ecological crisis that's unfolding around us. So that's the first dimension of the crisis that I think we have to consider uh, when we talk about the multiple crises of capital, capitalism. The second, which has become increasingly prominent in recent months, is the crisis associated with the sharpening inter-imperialist conflict that we're seeing, exemplified by the war in Ukraine. And we have to remember, I mean, this is a very, very serious uh, event that's taking place in Ukraine. This is the return of a major conventional uh, land war to Europe, uh, pitching as it does a major nuclear power on the, one, on the one hand, Russia, against a country allied to other major nuclear powers such as America and Britain. Uh, this is a very, very serious uh, situation that's unfolding. And so it's worth stepping back from this and understanding the logic that's driving it. Uh, when we in, this, in, the, in the socialist and Marxist tradition talk about imperialism, very important to recognize we're not simply talking about the oppression of the global south by the global north, very important though that is as a dimension of imperialism. Uh, we also mean when we talk about imperialism, the way in which the major capitalist powers, the great powers of the global north, if you like, are systematically drawn into conflict with one another. And the reason for that is that if we want to understand what imperialism is, it's the growing together of economic capitalist competition with the geopolitical conflict between states. It's the way in which states and corporations begin to mesh together and become increasingly interdependent. And as this happens, the clashes that take place on a global scale are not simply economic battles, but can also constantly threaten to spill over into political and military, uh, military struggles as different states try to en enhance and preserve their position in this world system. So we look at the current conflict in, in, in Ukraine. The current conflict, as pretty much everyone on the left recognizes, is an expression to a very large extent of Russian imperialism. Um, Russia has sought since the end of the Cold War to preserve and expand its influence in, in bits of the former Soviet Union, its allies in Eastern Europe. Um, and, and to that extent, yes, of course, it's an expression of Russian imperialism. Uh, it's one that we should uh, oppose, and it's one that we should vociferously demonstrate against and, and, and protest against. But it's not simply an expression of Russian uh, imperialism, and the war is not simply a war of national self-defense on the part of Ukrainians. It also reflects the way in which NATO and US influence and the European Union as well as a part of this have expanded ever further eastward since the end of the Cold War, incorporating more and more Eastern European countries into their sphere, sphere of influence. And Russia's actions reflect an attempt to stop Ukraine shifting further into the Western camp by joining the EU or NATO. In other words, the, Ukraine has emerged 
as a major fault line on the Eurasian supercontinent between uh, Russia and NATO. And that's why the US and NATO are extremely heavily involved in the conflict. If you look at what America in particular, the US in particular, is trying to do through the conflict in, in Ukraine, the US is trying to revive US imperialism in the wake of the disastrous defeats of Af in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's seeking to um, both revitalize its imperialist project, but also secure its hegemony over smaller European powers uh, on the continent. Uh, to demonstrate US leadership over Western imperialism, and it's seeking, seeking to, Russia, to weaken Russia through the conflict, one of its rivals, in order to pave the way for the really important conflict uh, that American imperialism faces, which is the, the global competition between the US and China to shape uh, the current century. And as such, the war in Ukraine is also a major proxy war for NATO and the US. And this is becoming very, very clear. Uh, over the next six months, the US is planning to spend $54 billion supporting Ukraine. Uh, $54 billion equates to about 80% of Russia's entire annual military budget. Uh, we're talking about twice as much as the U entire Ukrainian state budget in the pre-war pre period. This is huge, huge intervention. Uh, NATO now has 40,000 troops stationed on what it calls its eastern flank uh, bordering Ukraine. And it's now possible that Finland and Sweden will join NATO, expanding the border between NATO and Russia uh, through Finland's involvement by another 1,300 kilometers. Uh, this is a huge revitalization of NATO that's going on in the context of Ukraine. So we have to, it's not, it's not sufficient to condemn Russian imperialism. We, we have to condemn imperialism on both sides and we have to argue uh, against the escalation of this conflict. We have to argue for de-escalation um, on, on, on both sides and we have to consistently oppose what our own ruling class is doing. And that applies equally uh, to your country and to mine. Boris Johnson has again today pledged his support for the Ukrainian uh, government. The third dimension of the crisis I want to talk about, flowing out of capitalism, is of course the, the broader economic crisis that we face. And here we're not just talking about the immediacy of an e economic crisis, we're talking about what Marxist economists, particularly uh, Michael Roberts and, and, and myself, uh, but other increasingly other Marxist economists, talk about as a long depression of capitalism. Uh, a, a grinding crisis over many, many years. And what we mean by this is that if you look at the trajectory of capitalism in the post-war period, you had this period in the 50s and 60s through to the 70s of, of, of quite a rapid expansion of capitalism. Through this period, you get what, what Karl Marx argued would happen, which is a long decline of profitability in the capitalist system. And since really the, the early 1980s, Global capitalism, particularly the historic core of the system, has been trapped in a period of relatively low profitability. In other words, the vitality of the capitalist system has been running down over time and has reached this point at which profit rates remain at relatively low levels for long periods of time over, over the course of decades. And what this period of low profitability means is first of all, the growth of the real, what we call the real economy, the bit of the economy that produces goods and services, if you like, has become far, far weaker than in the past. This Im impulse to driving the capitalist system forwards has weakened. As this has happened, capitalism has become increasingly dependent on credit expansion to drive it forwards. Um, and this is why you get a series of bubbles in the sphere of finance and underpinning these bubbles in the financial sphere, you think about cryptocurrencies or property bubbles and commodity bubbles and so on, underpinning all these, you get this mega bubble of credit and this drives the system forwards. 
but it also leads to instability and crisis. We saw in 2008-2009 a major global recession triggered in the world of finance spreading to this weakened real economy, plunging the world into, in, in, into a recession. And what you got in 2008-2009 was states and central banks working together, stepping into this crisis to essentially bail out the capitalist system using both direct state intervention but also ultra low interest rates, quantitative easing and so on to further expand uh, credit and finance to, to pull the economy out of its slump. Because that happened, it meant that there was never any clear out in this crisis or in other recent crises of unprofitable capitalist firms. What we have in, in contemporary capitalism is a mass of relatively unprofitable zombie firms, often quite heavily indebted, lumbering forwards, dragging the system down. At the same time, because of these forms of intervention, you get a further expansion of credit and finance. Uh, and it, it's not just now the big economies of the historic core of capitalism. China after 2008, 2009 also became far more credit uh, dependent in driving its growth forwards, which is why you now get uh, problems in the property market in China or problems with the so-called shadow banking system in China. So we're getting this prolonged crisis of the capitalist system. And you saw in the pandemic how this logic of state intervention was further radicalized. Again, massive state intervention. At one point, the British state was supporting about a third of the labor force for its uh, furlough scheme, for example. Again, ultra low interest rates, quantitative easing, and so on to drive the system, to drive the system forwards. So this is a very, very prolonged problem that capitalism uh, faces. What I want to finish by is talking about, first of all, the way that th these three elements of crisis are fused together in the current cost of living crisis, and I'll say a few words about resistance. Uh, the current crisis brings together the ecological crisis and the pandemic associated with it, the war, and this long, long uh, period of depressed growth of capitalism. So when the pandemic hits, there's this very sharp sl show uh, slowdown of the cap capitalist economy, large scale state intervention. Uh, and, and in many uh, core uh, capitalist countries, you get furlough schemes, you get lockdowns and all the rest of it. Why are we seeing this surge in prices at the moment? The first thing that triggers it is that the, the global economy reopens. You have the collision of all the pent up demand from the period of the lockdown coming together with disrupted supply chains, disordered labor markets, uh, shortages of, of, of basic goods, and so on and so forth. And it drives this, this initial surge of prices. Then you, uh, 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 and then you get the war in Ukraine. And the Euro war in uh, Ukraine radicalizes th th this rise in prices by driving up food and energy prices. Russia, of course, is one of the big energy exporters on a global scale. Both Russia and Ukraine are really important food uh, exporters, uh, grain exporters in particular. And the particular importance of, of Ukraine and Russia is, is, is in particular to the global south. Um, there are 161 million people globally uh, now on the edge of extreme food insecurity. Many millions more will now be pushed into starvation by the events in, 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 in Ukraine. It's a really, uh, a really major uh, issue in terms of world starvation. But it's not just in the global south you're seeing the surge of inflation. It's now generalizing in much of the global north. And this is, is not contrary to the, the rhetoric coming from the central bankers. It's not been driven by wage increases. Of course, workers are fighting for better wages, but wage increases run far behind inflation. We found out in Britain this week that we've just experienced the sharpest decrease in real wages uh, since this particular series of records began. Wages are actually falling in real terms at a very, very sharp rate. If you want to understand what's keeping inflation alive, it's being kept alive by profiteering, by firms 
responding to this cost of living crisis by raising prices to restore their profit margins. And in the case of the big energy companies, it, it is simple profiteering. And this, of course, is reinforced by financial speculation and all the other financialized mechanisms that we know about. However, and this is a really important point, this is happening in the context of the great, uh, of this long depression of capitalism. And this is a huge problem because the only way that the ruling class know to try to tame um, inflation is to raise interest rates, which in some ways is nonsensical because if you look at the inflation, a lot of it's being imported into countries, simply raising interest rates to try to control credit creation and monetary expansion and so on, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The only way this can actually work to, to tame inflation is effectively by crashing the global economy and driving it into recession. And this is the big threat that's hanging over the global system now, that this inflationary crisis is met by a rise in interest rates that collapses this pyramid of credit on which the system has depended uh, and actually plunges the economy into recession and more pain for working class working class people. This is a dilemma the ruling class face, but it's important to, to, to say, this is a fundamental contradiction of capitalism working itself out here. This is the problem of low profitability colliding with this inflationary uh, crisis. To finish, if, if I may, um, just very briefly, what do socialists say about this situation? I think the first thing I, we should say is that there's a very widespread expectation from workers because of what happened in the pandemic, that the state is gonna come in and rescue them. Now, we shouldn't have any illusions in the state. The state is a vehicle for capitalism, imperialism, and all the rest of it. But nonetheless, we shouldn't be afraid to make demands of the capitalist state. We know, as the great revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg told us, that when working class people rest our demands from the state through struggle for organization, it increases our combativity, our organization, and the power and confidence of the working class. So we should fight for reforms within the capitalist system. We also have to fight alongside those workers taking direct action uh, in order to protect their living standards from this cost of living crisis. This is a global phenomenon now. Uh, we should remember that the sharp escalation of food prices was one of the factors that drove the Great Arab Spring of 2011. Uh, the increase in prices drove the wave of global revolts in Latin America and Lebanon and other countries in 2019. And we're again today in countries like Sri Lanka, Iran, and in many other countries, beginning to see major struggles erupting as workers and other oppressed groups try to defend themselves from this crisis. Even in countries like Britain, I mentioned the big march we had today, the most exciting contingent was the rail workers, because the rail workers are about to launch a series of national rail strikes in Britain. And when rail workers go on strike, you notice it, that, that the country grinds to a halt. They have real uh, power in their hands. If these groups of workers begin to break through and win their demands, it can begin to spread and infect other bits of the working class. Final point, and I'll finish on this, we have to connect these struggles. We have to connect these struggles to the notion of working class people imposing their solutions in the crisis. And in the long run, it's not simply about the immediacy of the cost of living crisis. It's about saying to groups of workers, actually the capitalist system has become a system ever more deeply mired in these multiple intersecting, combining, building crises. And unless we want to have a miserable future for ourselves, for our children and those we love, we have to start to talk about a challenge, mounting a serious challenge to the capitalist system as a whole. We have to begin to fight the system that drives crisis and that ultimately means going back to the old socialist argument that we face a choice, socialism or barbarism. I'll finish there. Thank you so much, Joseph. Okay, so I'm going to call on our next speaker, Erfan Rizé, who's joining us from uh, Vancouver. <laughs> 
Thank you, Vailene. Um, I'm just going to, if it's okay with everyone, share my screen here. Oops. Can you see that? Yep. Yep. Okay. So um, thanks for inviting me. And oh, uh, thank you, Joseph. We a great talk. I'm, I, my, uh, 10 minute talk here is I'm going to talk about specifically um, the crisis of capitalism and the climate uh, relationship to capitalism's crises, many crises that Joseph alluded to uh, with respect to British Columbia. So I'm I'm Erfan Rezai and I'm currently residing in the ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Salitude people um, in what's called Vancouver, Canada and British Columbia, the province here. And a lot of the content here is from also my colleague Bradley Hughes, who from the Socialist Worker paper. So thanks to him. Of course, like yeah, there are all these other crises of inequality and um, you know homelessness, um, housing affordability here as well that we could talk about. But had a particularly miserable year uh, with respect to the climate crisis. So that's what I'll focus on, and try to link that to um, all these other crises. So the um, current uh, and most recent, uh, for the past few years, the government of this province of British Columbia has been a, was initially a, a Green Party, um, NDP, NDP being the New Democrat Party or a sort of a left of center political party, which remains in power. So think of it as a so-called so left-leaning party. Um, and this uh, this party has known for years and, uh, political parties before that through their own reports uh, about the risks posed by climate change through their own auditor general reports through their own ministry of environment and climate change strategy um, that increased forest fires um, atmospheric rivers uh, they've known since 2018 as, as early as that specifically about these specific kinds of disasters and this is just showing you um, a research uh, initiative in in University of British Columbia, looking at the genetic uh, traces of, of trees through their the effect, the damage uh, to the or the change to the genetic makeup of trees mm -hmm. after all these forest fires and the effect that it has on the resilience to absorb water and so on over time. So this simulation to show the runaway effect of forest fires and drought. And so knowing all this stuff um, and knowing um, you know all, how to be prepared for these disasters. Uh, nothing was really done. Uh, so starting last year, early uh, or late June, uh, we knew kind of a couple of weeks ahead of time that we were going to get some a so-called heat dome, a, 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 a in, you know inverse of some kind of pressure system that would create really high temperatures in this region. And really nothing was done to prepare for it. And over 600 people died directly as a result of this, uh, which a couple of weeks ago, a report came out showing that all of these were preventable deaths, that um, the ambulance and, and health services were not adequately uh, funded and prepared. And, um, and these high temperatures led to an entire town burning. So the town of Lytton, uh, reached uh, shattered the temperature record set in Canada and, and much of North America uh, reached almost 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, the previous record was five degrees Celsius but below that 45 degrees um, back in 1937. Uh, these are all of the records below before that were all also in BC that same week. Um, these are temperatures never seen before um, in North America. And so this entire town uh, burnt down um, and at the First Nation region there, the, the chief of the First Nation uh, tribe also recalls that the, the system cared more about their cattle than the livelihood of, uh, of, the, of the safety of people. Uh, that uh, led to, of course, more forest fires. One of the third worst fire, forest fire season in this province's history. Um, 
uh, for a, a, a season that starts started earlier and ended later than usual, uh, going all the way to sometime in October, early November, and reaching a size of something like burning the size of the island of Puerto Rico. And over $600 million was spent on this uh, fighting for forest fires. So again, a reactionary um, uh, approach, uh, similar to the effect of the heat dome. The, the uh, sort of disaster upon disaster kept occurring last year. Um, so in November, just after the forest fire season, a, again, this well-known phenomena, atmospheric river, uh, fell on the province, and specifically on a region where, um, over time, through capitalism's expansion, as Joseph referred to, through the agricultural industry, uh, these lakes had been dried out, and those lakes flooded through this atmospheric, those dried out lakes flooded and um, destroyed a lot of farms. Um, and destroyed the livelihood of a lot of farmers. And this again was well known as, a, as an event. Um, the government was not prepared and again has been reacting to it. And, and during that same time, the, the same left of center government sent a militarized RCMP police, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, to raid the First Nation territory, the Wet'suwet'en people. Uh, this is the nation through which, um, the territory through which a coastal, uh, a gas gas link pipeline, a name of coastal gas link, which would send um, fracked gas to a liquefied natural gas facility that this government has, has approved and subsidized and has, has continually supporting, even though um, the land defenders are peaceful, peacefully blocking this. Um, um, the hereditary chiefs uh, clearly against it, and the same government um, upholding the uh, or approving the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and at the same time, um, basically sending the military to remove peaceful uh, protests of this. A blockade of this pipeline. And this is all also in the shadow of the finding in that same summer in 2021, or just before that, of the mass graves of children, indigenous children on residential school grounds near Kamloops of the Kamloops um, uh, nation. And so a, a great uh, deal of mourning and um, and realization of the colonial uh, effect of of Canada. This is is could, you could not be more um, blind to that by sending the militarized RCMP to this territory. And uh, this this again this uh, sort of left of center party um, has been subsidizing through all these years and continues to do so, major oil and gas uh, projects. So not just these gas pipelines, but oil pipelines that will again, expand the uh, amount of CO2 that will be burned over decades while we are in this climate chaos uh, crisis. And this uh, uh, continues these, the amount of money going into these projects continues to supersede the amount of money going to these health services, for example, that could have prevented 600, over 600 deaths to the heat dome and, and numerous uh, other crises from the atmospheric rivers, forest fires, and so on that I mentioned. So these have, these have been, uh, you know, if that's not bad enough, the same government is uh, still harvesting old growth, only, only fewer than less 3% of the old growth, you know, thousand year old trees remain. And uh, save old growth, you may have heard on the news, has increased and wrapped up their their uh, nonviolent resistance to to demand the end of old growth logging. So these have been the uh, responses by the 
left the center government, initially co co uh, coalition with the Green Party, destroying, destroying the land, um, ignoring their own reports about the effects of climate change, and at the same time, continuously subsidizing oil and gas projects to further increase the emissions and and uh, at the same time it, it imposing these these projects through first nation territory uh, who, 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 whose, whose waterways and, and ways of life are will be dramatically negatively affected and uh, we saw in 2020 just before the pandemic, the solidarity across Canada, uh, so-called Canada, and uh, uh, of the West to the Wet'suwet'en people, to the same um, to the same reasons, uh, we saw thousands of people over several days and weeks. Uh, trade unions supporting this, blocking ports, blocking trains, a real uh, show of resistance that affected uh, the response from the governments. And unfortunately, due to, I think, the combination of the pandemic and these incredible series of climate crises in BC last year, a similar level of solidarity was not shown um, when they raided Wet'suwet'en territory during the floods in November 2021. But it, is clear to, it should be clear to all of us that if a, a left-leaning government coalesced, co with a coalition with the Green Party has been responsible for all of this, and this has been the response that the only solution is to shut down all of these uh, projects, to shut down these, uh, as Joseph mentioned, this intertwining of these corporations in the state uh, to resist against them in the streets and and uh, and not wait for legislative change in parliament. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Erfan. Uh, our final speaker will be Michelle Robidoux. Great, and you can leave that on. Uh, Perfect. Thank you so much to uh, both of the previous speakers. And um, are you getting sound? No. Yeah. We need to, we just need to speak louder. Ah, sorry. We're uh, we're dealing with a few uh, different Should microphones. I... No, I think that's Can okay. Hear Can't hear Can me. Hear no. Okay. It's, it's in the room. Ah, okay. So I will project. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to try and quickly uh, run through a couple of um, maybe a couple of uh, complementary points to what has been talked about so far. Uh, and starting with the fact that in um, in late May, Oxfam published a report called Profiting from Pain. And it said that as the cost of essential goods rises faster than it has in decades, billionaires in the food and energy sectors are increasing their fortunes by $1 billion every two days. Uh, billionaires' wealth has risen more in the first 24 months of COVID than in 23 years combined. It's just to give people a bit of a, of, of a sense of just how dramatic, um, how, how dramatic this is. And at the same time, while there's a new billionaire uh, being created at the rate of one every 30 hours in this period, in during COVID, they expect that 263 million more people will crash into extreme poverty in the, uh, you know, in this time coming out of COVID at a rate of a million people every 33 hours. So that was a, a recent report that just was published a few weeks ago. While food and agribusiness billionaires raised their collective wealth by 40, 42% in the past two years, global food prices have soared as, as uh, Joseph talked about. And uh, last year it was 33.6% overall. And of course, when you go country by country, this varies quite a bit, but that's overall. And it's expected to rise another 23% in 2022. 
And just to mention, in terms of Canada, the grocery giant Loblaws reported that its first quarter earnings rose almost 40% compared to last year. Um, and it was uh, in an article that I was reading, it was described as uh, greedflation. So as we talk about the causes of inflation, uh, that's one to, to keep in mind. At the same time as this Oxfam report was published, another report titled, How the US Oil and Gas Sector is Using the War in Ukraine to Undermine Paris-Aligned Climate Policy. It's a very long title for the report, but it's a fascinating look. Uh, what they did was they described in great detail how big fossil fuel companies worked overtime in the lead up to the Russia-Ukraine war in February to both spin why energy prices are rising and to win ground in their battle for greater profits against, against the initiatives to try and decarbonize. And uh, this is, I'm reading from the report. The report finds three key messages across hundreds of social media posts and media appearances. American fossil fuel production, this, this is their first message. American fossil fuel production ensures freedom and national security. Number two, high gas prices are caused by climate policy. And the solution therefore is more drilling. And number three, climate change is something only liberal woke uh, uh, elites care about. And so they literally like on, they, they document how in interview after interview, the American Petroleum Institute and all of their associated uh, uh, spin doctors were on media um, uh, carrying this message. By March 25th, Biden was announcing a US European Union liquefied natural gas deal that the Trump administration had tried and failed to get done. 15 billion cubic meters in 2022 with a standing order for 50 billion cubic meters every year until 2030. And uh, one of the people that they, uh, they uh, interviewed for this report, uh, who is a, a person who analyzes disinformation from the oil industry, she used to be an oil industry <laughs> flack actually. She said, that's, that's what they accomplished in just a little over four weeks. Um, a very short interval. That interval should alarm lawmakers. It should alarm people in the climate community. That is disaster capitalism. And, and so just, just in terms of this context that we're in of record profits in the food energy sectors, and this is what's going on in the background. So as grocery bills and the cost of fuel go through the roof and food and energy giants rake in staggering profits, workers are struggling to keep up. We all know that. Uh, it's led to growing fights over pay across this country and many other places around the world. Uh, and, and Joseph mentioned this question of a wage price spiral, and that's what the mouthpieces for business and government want us to believe is going on. Um, but the uh, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives published a report just this week, a couple of days ago, where they found that it's actually a profit and price spiral. Um, in the fourth quarter of 2019, and so before COVID, Corporate profits represented 12.4% of GDP. By the first quarter of 2022, that had risen to 15.2% of GDP. So it's going up pretty dramatically. This, it's a three times larger jump than any previous post-recession boost in profits over the last 50 years. Like There's no parallel to it. Meanwhile, workers' wages fell from 51% of GDP to 50.2%. And again, like how the, what their methodology is about this, I don't know. But by the sort of these are these are uh, their figures, they're seeing this decline while profits go up. In a different take on who's to blame for inflation, in an interview yesterday with the Star, the Ed Board of the Star, our finance minister Christian Freeland said. Easy and fun as it would be for progressive politicians to say inflation is the fault of bad business people in Canada, that really wouldn't be fair or true. When it comes to food prices, if you wanted to blame one person who committed this, I can tell you his name. His name is Vladimir Putin. And so that, that is what she's putting forward. And that serves a number of purposes. Uh, I don't have time to get into in great detail, but not least the huge boost in military spending the Trudeau government put in its budget. Uh, that, that will mean a doubling of military spending between 2016 and 2026. That's, that's what, we, what, what their answer has been. So there's a huge battle of ideas. The rich and powerful are not resting and trying to win ideological, these ideological battles and real battles um, as these crises unfold. Uh, 
And we, we've seen the kind of political polarization uh, here that, that is happening around the world, both to the left and to the right. If you think just a year ago, um, uh, uh, as Erfan mentioned, the, uh, the reporting on the finding of mass graves of indigenous children on the sites of res former residential schools, that, that led to such an upsurge and uh, such a grief and outrage, uh, an upsurge in mobilization so that on July 1st, which is Canada Day, tens of thousands took part in activities commemorating the thousands of indigenous children who died in these schools instead of celebrating Canada Day. This year, where the convoy has reshaped the terrain, the initiative has swung to the right, where they are planning Canada Day activities on Parliament Hill of the far right led convoy type of movement. And, and so this is the context of polarization. I wanna say a few things about the NDP. We heard about BC where the NDP is in power and has carried out a business as usual response to these multiple crises. Federally, the NDP decided to enter into a supply and confidence agreement with the Liberals last, this March, just a few months ago, in the middle of the convoy and everything that was going on in Ottawa and elsewhere. And, uh, uh, and a convoy which was gaining a hearing based quite significantly on hatred of the Trudeau government, which we would, we would certainly uh, share. Uh, in, and also in the midst of a war in Ukraine, uh, when this government is, is uh, ramping up military spending. So they made this agreement not to bring down the government. The rationale was this arrangement could provide concrete gains on pharmacare, dental care, and show how effective the NDP could be even in uh, opposition. Um, but far from improving the NDP's fortunes, I would argue it's made things worse by both rendering any critique of the Liberal government toothless uh, from the NDP and whittling down expectations in the face of an unprecedented series of crises. And we saw some of the impact of this in the recent Ontario election. There are many reasons for the Ontario NDP losing nine seats in the June 2nd election, but the Liberal NDP agreement did not help in working class communities that have been hit hard by these crises that Trudeau is managing. And there's a lot to say about the provincial election. Uh, uh, I don't have time, obviously, for those of us in Ontario, uh, uh, which returned Doug Ford to office for a second term with a majority. Um, the nicest thing one could say about the NDP campaign is lackluster. But uh, I think um, I read a, a couple of interviews with different activists and Erica Ifill, who some of you may know, who's a, a quite prominent activist um, uh, and an economist said in an interview on the breach, I think the whole political class decided that the pandemic was over and they're going to turn the page and then the media followed suit. What I don't understand is if you are the NDP and the Liberals, why are you not talking about the pandemic at every turn? Why are you not reminding people that Doug Ford took federal money, sat on it and only used it to pay down the deficit, therefore sacrificing the lives of your loved ones? It's not that hard. Every second day they should be hammering that home and they haven't been. I just feel like they've lost the plot. I just think there's so many missed opportunities in this entire election. And I'm actually kind of disgusted with the way it's gone on because these are so important. These decisions will build the trajectory of public ser services for decades to come. That kind of anger and that kind of clarity, I think is it, it's much more widespread uh, than the belief that the uh, uh, federal NDP liberal uh, agreement is, 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 going to, uh, is going to save us. So confronting these crises, obviously, we, uh, I, you know, I feel a bit pressed for time. So tell me if uh, yeah. I got to yeah. wrap up here. Um, but we talk, we're going to talk uh, throughout the day about building movements on the streets, whether it's around the fight for services, around climate justice, indigenous sovereignty, fighting austerity, racism, and critically the far right, which we're going to talk about in the next session, but also building solidarity with and bolstering workers' struggles. And, um, I think uh, we know there are a number of upcoming struggles that are critical. They're critical because the working class, uh, as Joseph talked about, has the power to actually point in a different direction. The confidence that is built by workers actually striking out, as we've seen, even just organizing a union at Amazon, it has increased people's confidence to fight back. Um, the, I'll mention just one 
thing, the Public Service Alliance of Canada, 120,000 federal public sector workers have been offered a derisory 1.7% uh, per year uh, by the federal government as a wage increase when uh, inflation is 6.7. Right now it's 6.7. Who knows what it'll be when they actually sign a deal. And so uh, they are, they're fighting and they're, they're not accepting it. And so we need to keep our eye on, on that prize. Um, I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that and we can uh, discuss more in, in the discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, so we have a little bit of time for discussion before I ask the speakers to come back. So if you want to raise your hand if you're in the room or uh, raise your hand if you're online. And uh, if I could ask you to keep your comments maybe to a couple of minutes, just so we can try and get as many people as possible. So uh, online, I see someone named Enrique. Yep. Hello, Enrique. Uh, Mark's 21 from California here. Um, I've been listening to the um, to, to this meeting uh, just for a couple of minutes because I came back from from an, from an errand. But I do have a quick question that I, I heard um, discussion about the convoy and um, and all that. I wanted to know about the opinions of um, of comrades in Canada about um, the role of um, American agitators from the far right coming into Canada. Do you think that's a relevant fear or uh, um or something that we should worry about at all or is it um or is it like genuine have is there any like horror stories of like um of like uh the worst of our people coming over there like i just that's just my question thanks and as i mentioned just so people are aware uh, the speakers will come back to questions and comments at the end of the discussion uh the next speaker is sid and if possible, if you're in the room, if you can come up closer to the mic here, that would be great. Yeah, just very, very quickly on that. That's not actually what I was gonna talk about initially, um, but we have plenty enough people on the far right and enough racists and horrible people in Canada to sort of, to, to lead this movement. Was there support from the US? Of course there, there was, um, but that's not terribly surprising. But the main support in Canada, the, when you start taking into it, is coming from the oil and gas industries, is coming from a, a layer of people sort of on the far right in, in those particular institutions. When you look at uh, the Freedom to Roll convoy, which was a, a previous one, it was all about Canadian oil and gas and supporting sort of Canadian, uh, uh, well, I mean, fossil fuel industries. The question, though, that I wanted to ask um, is about the war in Ukraine. And specifically, Joseph and people who are from uh, the US and wondering if there's anything that we can talk about around this. We have had a horrible time trying to build an anti-war movement in Canada. Um, the, there was sort of, as soon as the war in Ukraine erupted, there were two polls that we saw uh, develop. One of which was Ukrainian Canadians who were calling for, in, in marching in tens of thousands, but they were calling for a no-fly zone. They were calling for increased NATO weaponry. Then we have, on the other hand, an element around, particularly around the Communist Party that was calling for a specifically pro-Russia stance, pro-China, pro-Russia stance. And it's been incredibly difficult for us to try to find a way to maneuver through the middle of this. And I'm just wondering if in the US and the UK, the UK stopped the war in the UK was in many ways sort of the leader of the global anti-war movements for many years. And, and we're trying to figure out how we can grapple with pulling something together because the concern, and Michelle brought this up, half a trillion dollars in military spending under the Trudeau government. And they're planning on increasing this. They've now opened up six military bases around the world. Canada is expanding its imperial footprint as much as it possibly can and spending billions of dollars doing so. And it's really, really tough for us to try to figure out a way to be able to maneuver around that. The one thing that has sort of galvanized a layer of people is specifically campaigns against that military spending, against you know, trying to talk about redirecting military spending to, to housing, to, to, you know, various other supports. And I'm just wondering if anyone, either in the US or UK or anywhere else in the world that you might be sort of looking at this or other cities across Canada, what have you been dealing with around this question? Because it's been incredibly difficult for us to pull something together. And it's a tremendous weakness. If we do not have a clear anti-imperialist movement, it, it makes, it, it causes huge amounts of confusion uh, for large uh, sections of people on the left, and it's something that we really need to figure out how to rectify. 
Thanks, Sid. Uh, the next speaker online is Ali. Ali. You're muted. Ali, you need to turn your mute off. Okay. Uh, thanks for the panel. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, my question is, uh, this war, the war that's going on now in Ukraine, when you compare it to the conflict that existed before the, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was clear, I was growing up in those days, it was the West versus the East, Warsaw versus uh, NATO. Now, the, the problem is Russia under Putin is not a socialist country, many people may probably think, is another capitalist. So this war is one capitalist block versus another capitalist block. And it is a little bit blurred for a lot of people. You know, people see it, well, it is the old Soviet reviving. Uh, my question to Joseph is that uh, we mentioned that, and how could we make clear to people that the war that is continuing on now is not one Russia versus uh, a capitalist West, but it's uh, one block of capitalists trying to grow and dominate part of Europe and another uh, part of Africa also. For example, there is a competition from China, Russia, and the Soviet Union to get access or get a base in Somaliland, Djibouti, in the Horn of Africa, a very strategic lo location. I was there, at, you know, uh, during the, uh, before the war, uh, I know the impact of the, of the climate change, of the prices is very, very devastating. Prices are very high. I'm not going to talk about that, but thing is the conflict is a little bit for people there. You know, the people really don't see this. It's Russia invading Ukraine and the West trying to save Ukraine from the Russian invasion. But the thing is a conflict between one capitalist which is an, uh, the Western bloc versus another capitalist competing for the resources of the world as well as Europe. Uh, that's my question. Okay, War, you. Uh, you made it very clear. The socialists have got a very clear understanding, but many people do not understand this war. And they see it, you know, that Russia invaded Ukraine. Yes, true, Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia is the aggression. Russia is the one who attacked, who is destroying cities, who is devastating Ukraine. We know that. But the other bloc also is trying to, is, you know, uh, you have seen, is, as Michelle has said, it's about 40, 50 billion that they're spending. It's a proxy war. Unfortunately, the, the Ukrainian side died. So how do we make clear to people that this is not a war between, uh, well, how do we make clear what this war really is? It's a war between two blocks. And this okay. time it's not a socialist versus a capitalist versus a capitalist versus another capitalist. Uh, compare that to the World War One. Uh, sorry, World War Two. All right, I, I just, and thank you very much. Thanks, Ali. Uh, okay, our next speaker is Brian, who's in the room. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for the great talk and the discussion. Uh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, speak a little bit about the, the climate crisis. And I really appreciated Irfan uh, uh, showing the devastation that really happened in uh, BC uh, over the past year. And, um, you know, just before the pandemic, and you touched on this as well, uh, we had this fantastic movement uh, across the country, which uh, is taking from the lead of the uh, West Oden people who were, uh, you know, basically had been invaded by the RCMP in order for the CDL pipeline to be built. You know, thousands of people across the country, uh, led by Indigenous people, blocked rail, blocked ports, blocked roads, um, and actually forced ministers from both the federal and the BC government to the table. Uh, and, and, you know, it was for them to offer the same thing they've offered before, which is basically, we're taking your rights away, and we're going to build the pipeline, and 
Um, and so essentially empty promises um, uh, and so on, but the pandemic continues. But at the same time, we have the, that that um, struggle is still ongoing on the front line. Um, the uh, land defenders are reinvigorating the call for action. There are people who have adopted RBC branches across the country. Um, there have been ongoing actions, including at the RBC Canadian Open, where um, the huge blog doll of uh, RBC uh, CEO Dave McKay uh, was the backdrop for a rave against RBC, right? As people, spectators were coming into the tournament. Um, the, the point is, I the point I'm trying to make is that I think those that those feelings of solidarity from workers, from ordinary people, have not gone away. It's just we have to constantly be thinking: How do we mobilize the sentiment um, in this context? And I think there's a couple of things uh, to point out. And that's I think we have to be uh, thinking about how can we take back our communities? How can we take back our neighborhoods uh, through just doing political action out there? Uh, building that way forward. I think, um, I guess that's what all I want to say. Thanks, Brian. Um, I'm going to, I have time to take a couple more speakers. I'll apologize to people who weren't able to get on the list, but we'll be talking all throughout the day about many of the, the, these similar issues. So the next speaker is Bradley on the phone or on the line. Is Bradley speaking? Um, you're muted, Bradley, somehow. Bradley? It says you're unmuted, but you appear to be muted. Uh, okay. So. Okay, so I'm going to take Eric then, and we'll come back. Oh, hi, uh, Eric in, in in New York, Mark Three One. I, I was going to ask a, a Joseph question about about profitability, but 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 first, someone was asking about the anti-war movement and, and 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 your difficulties there, and and here in in the United States, it's been it's you know from what I've seen, it's the same same problem. To a demonstration in Times Square, and it was the same thing. You had uh, a, a Ukrainian community from New York calling for calling for no-fly zones, and you also had a small bunch of you know supposed uh, code pink and people had a stage it was supposedly on on the anti-war thing from the left, but it was dominated by kind of campus tankies who you know who did nothing but condemn nato but but seemed to be on in, in the favor of the russian invasion in a way and i first i thought there was almost going to be fights between these two people who were in the same demonstration it was kind of horrible and i think i mean you mentioned that the stop war movement in 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 britain and we don't have any kind of permanent national anti-war movement with those politics and it's made a real difference it's made it much harder to to pull together a a, a decent uh, approach to that and i think you know part of that is is uh, you know the political organization socialist organizations that were behind building that coalition um, and it shows a, what, what, what difference that can make. Even in the anti-war, even in Stop the War, there are different voices, not everything that I'd agree with. But I, I'm part of a Brooklyn for Peace, which is one of the few local organizations from the Gulf War that stayed around, and by no means a far left organization. But they've been much more radical and, and much more sane about this than most of the left, because they've kept clear of the kind of campus pro left, Russia left, but also because they spent all this time campaigning against military spending and US intervention and don't want to see this as an excuse to ramp up military spending again. You know, so they've had a, a, a much, we've had a much a better approach to that. And I think, um, yeah, it's difficult building the things bigger, but keep it that you still have to keep a clear, clear analysis about this and build who we can around us to build a broader front um, who are not in favor of no fly zones or Russian imperialism. But I think it should become clear as this become comes on and just don't avoid making that analysis. If I if I have a second, um, 
just if I'd ask Joseph to explain, because you're talking about this long time of low profitability and all that behind all this, which is absolutely true. And yet you also hear, you know, many, many reports like Michelle Robideau was, was quoting about um, the increase in billionaires, about about the, the oil companies vastly increasing their profits, about some of these bigger firms increasing their profits. I mean, I've seen around here decline in profitability to the point of bankruptcy of a bunch of small firms, but you know, Amazon's sort of sucking that off and becoming more and more profitable and lar larger. So, what could, could you? How do those two things fit together? Uh, what, what's going on there? Thanks, Eric. Um, so, again, I want to apologize to people that I'm not able to call on, and please do put your hands up in the next session. Uh, uh, so, I'm going to give. A, a very brief two to three minutes to the speakers to wrap up. So we'll start in the same order. I'll start with Joseph Chunara. Yeah, thanks. So I'll be as brief as I can. There are some big complicated questions. I'll do my best. Um, look, on, on the Ukraine stuff um, and, and, and the war that's raging there, I have to say, I mean, when the war started, we thought that the pro-Russian camp was going to be a problem in forging anti-war movement. To be honest, they don't have much of a base. Certainly my experience in Britain, there are people who are pro-Russia pro and support the invasion and so on, but they're so distant from what the mass of decent, ordinary working class people on the left believe that they don't really have much purchase and they don't, they're not really growing very much. I think the far bigger problem is people who see Russian imperialism and essentially let NATO and the West off the hook. And, and that's the, the central argument we're having in trying to build an anti-war uh, an anti movement. And there we just have to go through the basic arguments, it seems to me. Boris Johnson, our prime minister, was in Kiev yesterday. He was meeting Zelensky. He was talking about um, providing more aid and support. He's talking about training Ukrainian troops. Um, Joe Biden, as I said, has given vast vast sums of money to Ukraine to support its war efforts. More and more, this does seem like a proxy war on the Western side. And therefore, we have to just go through those arguments with people. And as the scale of Western intervention has grown, we have more evidence to present. And it's very important. I, I, I posted an article in, in, in the chat online. Uh, there's a very interesting speech by Zelensky where it says, if we you know, come out of this war, um, don't expect Ukraine to be a sort of little Switzerland, a sort of soft, neutral country. Expect it to be a, a, a big Israel. In other words, a country linked to the Western security system. And he says explicitly armed troops in the supermarkets, uh, cinemas and so on and so forth. This is a proxy war between Western imperialism and, and, and Russian imperialism. That's not all it is. Of course, for many Ukrainians, it's a war of national defense, and we have to understand and acknowledge that, but we don't dismiss the imperialism of our own ruling class. Now, th that's the position of the Stop the War Coalition in Britain. On that basis, we've been able to carve out a little bit of space for an anti-war movement. I wouldn't say it's easy. It's not like the Iraq war where we put two million people on the streets. We're talking about relatively small groups of people protesting, but we have to remember socialists are often isolated at the beginning of wars. Nonetheless, you put the principled argument, you try and pull people around you, and you use the emergence of new evidence and facts and so on to try to support those arguments. That's all we can do. Uh, on the economic question, on, on Eric's point, um, yeah, I mean, when we talk about low profitability, we're talking about the average rate of profit across the capitalist system. Uh, there's lots of major capitalist firms that, that are highly profitable within that spectrum of firms, although just factually, there's a lot of pressure on Amazon's profit rates at the moment because they did extremely well during the lockdown. Then they now found that they've overexpanded the, the growth of capital and employees, and they're, they're, they're actually having to squeeze some of their um, areas of business. So they've shut down, a, I think, a couple of Whole Foods uh, stores in the US as part of this kind of retrenchment. So it's not always plain sailing for these companies. Um, Nonetheless, there's a spectrum of profitability. We're talking about the average rate of profit, be, profit being low. And secondly, we have to understand when we talk about the rate of profit, we're talking about the return on investment. Um, even if your profit is 
if your investment is a hundred billion dollars, you're getting a billion dollars of profit back. Your absolute profit can be quite high. So there's lots of cash floating around. It's just that the rate of expansion of the capitalism of capitalism slows as the rate of profit is slowing. Just finish on, a, on one point about the cost of living crisis. I think we have to understand, as people have mentioned, inflation is, is intensely ideological. All this stuff about the wage price spiral, I love the phrase profit, uh, profit price spiral, we'll, we'll, we'll have to use that. Um, there's a really interesting piece in the Financial Times saying that class has been missing from this economic debate for so long. Very, very, very interesting. Um, yesterday, there was a piece in the Financial Times, uh, the leading financial paper in Britain and one of the leading papers in the world. And it, it quoted a, a, a British minister saying, you know, we find the quote, if we get this wrong, we risk going into a de facto general strike that will create further talk turmoil and risk grinding the whole economy to a halt. The other side of this that we often don't recognize is a whiff of fear and panic in the ruling class. They're beginning to worry about working class people. We're bringing workers back into the economic debate. We have to continue that. And we have to argue with some, some groups of workers within that struggle. Capitalism is a fundamental problem here. I'll finish that. Thanks, Joseph. And thanks for joining us from Britain today. OK, so Erfan, I'll get, uh, hand it over to you if you have a a uh, couple of things you want to say? Sure, yeah, I'll be very quick. Um, uh, specifically to, to Brian, um, thanks for your comments. It, it, that's basically, yeah, my point was as well that, you know, we need to go back to that that feeling of solidarity that we had uh, just pre-pandemic with when people and and all of these crises, uh, people were, people do still see these connections. And one thing, one small thing Bradley and I are doing in our college is petitioning uh, people to, uh, to, to or rather cite a petition to to uh, demand RBC, the Royal Bank of Canada, who's one of the major uh, investors and owners of the company, uh, the construction company for that casting pipeline uh, that I mentioned, uh, going through Wet'suwet'en territory. One thing that the Wet'suwet'en elders has asked people to do is is to to ask these these banks like RBC to stop investing in them. So we're petitioning and sending our petitions to them. But we need to, yeah, bring that uh, feeling of solidarity back up to the surface because that that really, I think, my point was really, you know, when you see the preparedness and response by a left wing political party like the NDP, led by Premier John Horgan, who said, as Bradley was trying to say, in his uh, he couldn't uh, um, uh, use his mic, but he he mentioned to me that, you know, Horgan said at that time when they when they the over six hundred people died of the heat deaths in BC, that fatalities are a part of life, quote. That uh, during that, uh, after the discovery of these um, uh, hundreds of indigenous children on in the former residential schools that um, he still defended, you know, celebrating Canada Day. Um, and even years ago, uh, as Bradley mentioned, the indigenous protesters were on the legislature in Victoria and he, uh, he denounced them. So it's not only being tone deaf; it's it's being complicit to murder. It's being complicit to invading uh, uh, sovereign territory, unceded territory of indigenous people. And um, yeah, we need to really um, use this moment to show people that it doesn't matter. Capitalism is so powerful; it doesn't matter if you elect a left wing party to government. Right? It's people's lives are going to continue to be miserable, um, worse and worse due to these. Uh, multitude of crises, specifically here, the climate crisis. And we can see that these things are going to continue unless we you know, stand up to the oil and gas industry, stand up to these um, to capitalism's entrenchment to, to destroy the environment at the expense of people's livelihood uh, and well-being. So that's, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Erfan. And now I'll turn it over to our last speaker, Michelle. Yeah, I'm just going to uh, add just one thing to that is that uh, the ruling class are uh, right to be concerned and worried because they can't control the response that's going to come to the to the to these multiple crises. And and so with the premium is on when people are in struggle that socialists need to be building those struggles 
amplifying them in any way possible, in particular when struggles in workplaces happen. That is the key. And, uh, and I think we have good reason to be uh, confident that there are going to be multiplying uh, struggles like this. People don't have a choice in the matter. So this has been a really useful discussion and thank you to everyone for, for participating and we'll, uh, I guess, roll into uh, our next session. Thanks yes, so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to the speaker. So, Michelle, right, we are going to move right into the next uh, session of March.